Good morning. We're happy to see you here this morning. As we begin singing together this morning, if you did not pick up your communion elements on the way into the sanctuary, please do so during this first hymn. You will find them on either side at the tables down front. Please stand as we sing together. seated. Good morning. Good morning and welcome. It is a joy to welcome you to First Baptist this morning on this Halloween morning. We are glad that you are here to worship today. Just a few things to draw your attention to um, as we begin our time of worship today. The, this is a fifth Sunday. We will be celebrating the Lord's supper in just a few moments in worship and that also means that at the end of our service ushers will be at the various entrances um, and exits with offering plates for our, benevol for our benevolence offering. Um, so they will be there to collect that um, to help go, go to serve the needs of those in our community so keep that in mind. You'll see several announcements inside your bulletin. I want to highlight um, one in particular and that is on November 21st on November 21st, after worship, we will be going through the process of getting the church decorated for Christmas. Um, and those of you who have been part of that in the past know that it is a big job, but the more people who are helping with it, the easier and the smoother it is going to go. So our, some of our committees who are responsible for that are asking for help. So November 21st, right after worship, there will be a pizza lunch, and then we'll decorate the church, what a great moment, what a great opportunity to get into, begin to get into the spirit of Christmas and to begin to move forward towards the Advent season than by helping in decorating the church. Um, if you are going to play paintball on Saturday with the recreation ministry, we'll meet at the church at 8.30 um, next Saturday morning. Contact me if you need more details. If you didn't sign up but want to go, contact me too. We can still get you in. Um, so come shoot some paintballs at people. It'll be a good time. Yeah, with the love of Jesus in your heart. 
shoot the paintballs at people. It'll, it'll be good. You'll also see in your bulletin, um, the, we'll be taking a recreation trip to a Greenville Swamp Rabbits game. Um, that is December 18th. You'll see ticket information there. That is holiday hockey night. So they will be doing sing-alongs of Christmas carols in between periods and things like that. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I need to know if I need more tickets. So let me know if you're interested in that as soon as possible. Sign up on the pew pads. Um, that is open for all church members. I will now recognize Michael Burmaster, who has a word for us from the Pastor Search Committee. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Hull and Tommy both told me that I'd be preaching this morning. Um, and on behalf of the whole committee, we're all tired of being on the committee. So y'all consider this my application. We'll end this thing today. Okay? So. But on behalf of the Pastor Search Committee, I would like to thank each one of you for your prayers, your phone calls, the letters of love and words of encouragement during the beginning of this process. We would also like to thank all of you for coming out to the congregational conversation two weeks ago. We had some great conversations together around the table as we answered questions about our church, and I'm sure you all learned something that you possibly did not know before you came. This was done to help us begin the process. We feel we received some thoughtful and helpful information to help us form a profile of what we are looking for here at First Baptist Church. Now we would like to share with you what we heard and ask you to answer some additional questions to complete our pastoral profile. If you came to the first meeting, great. We need you to come back. If you did not attend, no worries. You can come to this one. On November 7th, next Sunday, Dr. Hull will lead us again through an hour and a half session. We'll start at 4 p.m. and finish at 5.30. We hope that you make plans to join us next Sunday at 4 o'clock in the Family Life Center. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Michael. It is a good day to gather and worship this morning. Would you join me in prayer as we continue in worship today? Father, how good it is to gather in your house. God, as we continue in this time of worship, we pray your blessings on us, your spirit with us and in us, and we pray that you would meet us here in this place. Guide us as we go. Speak to us now and direct our steps when we leave. Show us more about you and what it means to be your people. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.
Good morning. My name is Randy Downs, and uh, two things before I get started. One is I'm here to endorse Michael's candidacy for the uh, <laughs> pastorship in this church. I'm 100% behind him. Secondly, I think when Adair asked Tommy to ask me to do this, she wasn't aware that I was going to wear my Georgia Bulldog shirt up here today. So uh, somebody's got to support the Bulldogs here. So that's me. So uh, they asked me to share our story uh, in relation to the church, and my wife, Charles, and I's story starts uh, back several years ago, we'll go into how many years ago, in Roswell, Georgia. We were high school sweethearts, and we uh, grew up in the Methodist church together, and we lived there for 15 plus years, and then we were able to move to Charlotte. So we took a transfer to Charlotte, and uh, we had two boys, John and Casey. And um, it, while we were in Charlotte, we worshiped in the Methodist church as well. So we had Methodist background, uh, but both of those towns were, as you know, Roswell started as a small town, a lot like Lawrence, but it blew up. And then Charlotte, of course, blew up. So in October of 2004, when they had an opportunity to come to South Carolina, we looked around and we looked around in Greer and we looked around in Anderson and we look, looked around all over the place. But all those places were getting ready to do the same thing that Charlotte and, and Roswell had done, and that's explode. So we looked for a little, uh, a little town and uh, we got to look in, and I always wanted an old home. We couldn't find an old home in Charlotte because you couldn't afford an old home in Charlotte down Myers Park. So I was sitting in the uh, apartment one night before the, the family had moved down and uh, pulled up a website, and I see this house that's uh, got its own web page, Miss Lucy's house. And uh, for y'all that don't know who Miss Lucy was, she was here for 101 years on this earth, and uh, she, she uh, had this house. And so I found this house. I got my jeans on at 10 o'clock at night and drove down here uh, and uh, was talking to Charlie on the phone and I'm driving down Main Street and, uh, and I'm coming from, from the church side of town out toward our house on the right and I get to the sign on the street and it says Down Street. Now I don't know how much more of a sign you can have than that. You know, so I talked to her on the phone and I said I think this is where we need to be. So I honestly believe that God put us here for a reason in uh, 2004. So uh, we, we put an offer on the house um, before we even knew anything about Lawrence and she said don't you think that you ought to go down there and see what this town's all about. So I jumped in the car and came down and, and uh, started meeting people. But anyway that's kind of where our relationship started here in town. So I was over in Spartanburg one day calling on Mr. John Ferris Jr. because we worked together in, in the trucking industry and, and I told him sitting in his office he said have you found a place to live and I said I said, yeah, you know anything about Lawrence? <laughs> and, and, and of course, I had no idea that John had grown up here. So the first people that showed up on our doorstep uh, were John and Harriet Ferris. So uh, uh, John, John and Harriet Ferris showed up, and, and uh, John would pick me up every Thursday for the Rotary Club. <laughs> and I would drive back from Greenville, and uh, I'm sorry. But I would drive back from Greenville and John would say, you know, hey, I think you, this is the church you ought to join. And so we did some research and we looked at the Methodist church and we looked at the, um, we went to the Presbyterian church, but we found out about Tommy's youth ministry here. And so the boys were at a crucial time at fifth and sixth grade. And so we joined in. And uh, Mr. Ferris sat in the driveway one day with me. He said, hey, you know, you're gonna have to get dunked. <laughs> And it didn't, didn't know it at the time that Mr. Ferris had grown up in Methodist Church too. So he said, it's okay, it's not scary. He said, if you're too scared to do that, I'll go down there with you. So, so <laughs> needless to say, he didn't have to do that. But, um, so that was, that was our first exposure really to town, uh, other than Miss Lucy's house and our sign on the street. So, um, you know, we, we jumped in right away and the boys uh, joined John, or, uh, Tommy's youth group and got involved in a variety of things. Uh, Sunday's a big church, of course, Sunday night youth groups, Iwanatow Valley Beach Camps gar at Garden City, fifth quarters, ski trips, CMT mission trips, uh, feet to the street, and uh, accountability groups. And, uh, and Tommy had a parent meeting when we started and he said, does anybody here have a CDL? And I happen to have a CDL. So guess who got to be Tommy's driver from then on? Um, so we, we did a lot of that for six or seven years and the boys have, have of course gone on to college and, and moved on and as that has happened I've been involved in various things in the church ministry as well and, and uh, you know everything from uh, again mission trips to uh, 
men's group to Allendale mission trips, uh, local handyman missions. Uh, I've, I've served on the deacon board. The Sunday night men's group, which is a really good, uh, this is a commercial for that. If anybody wants to come to the men's group, you need to do that. Uh, and then he talked me in one day to, to lead in the axe class. And uh, that was a, it was a big step for me, but it's, it's meant a lot. Um, we, you know, the Axe class has their own group of uh, missions as well. We've done AMI Kids, and we've, we've done a lot of the handyman stuff together as the men's group, or the, the Axe class, rather. And so as, as we just wove into the fabric of the church, uh, F, FBC has been a great home for us, and I don't believe that there was any mistake in us being here. And I have no doubt that God led us here uh, over 15 years ago and set up our family for success. So, you know, we're not... We're not born and raised. We didn't, we didn't, you know, our grandparents weren't born in this church, but, but we have quickly become part of the fabric of the church, and, and we just appreciate our relationships here. We've developed way more relationships in this small little town than we ever, ever did in Charlotte or Atlanta. So from that aspect, I, I thank you all for all the prayers and support you've given us as a family. pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, for the gift of this beautiful fall morning, we give you thanks. We thank you for the blessings that you bestow upon us each and every day. As we gather here in your house today, let us give with cheerful and grateful hearts. You have blessed each of us in so many ways. Now we now give with grateful hearts in return to you. Bless these tithes and offerings so that they may be used to spread your word and love to those all around us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. a message to the saints 
The table has been set, so take your place. There is no more condemnation, there is only grace. This is a message to the saints. The table has been set, so take your place. There is no more condemnation. There is only grace. So, child of God, your adoption, it is done. Oh, this family is forever, and we've just begun. We Would you join me in a time of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, for the gift of this day, for the opportunity that we have today as a family of faith to gather in this place and worship you. Father, for that, we give thanks. We thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy that is fresh and new on this day and on every day. And we gather in this place today to simply love you, for you are the only one who is worthy of our praise and our worship. But Father, you also know us, so you know that we come to this place today as imperfect people. In the hustle and bustle of this life, it is so easy to drift from you. And so today, we ask for your forgiveness for those times. Search our hearts and reveal to us those areas where we have drifted from you. 
and where we need to grow. And by your grace, restore us into a right relationship with you. And Father, today we pray for those who are experiencing the difficulties of this life. We pray for those who on this day find themselves facing health concerns. We pray for those who are dealing with great loss and those who face uncertain futures. We pray for those who find themselves in the dark valleys of this life. We ask for your, the presence of your healing, your strength, your peace, and your comfort in these times. Help us to always remember that no matter what we face in this life, that you are near and that every battle we might face has already been won. And finally, Father, on this day, as we gather around your table and remember, we thank you for your amazing love for us. And may that love always remain at the center of our heart, our mind, and our soul. And we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I love the great looking pictures of the family of God. Sons and daughters of the King. And as the song said, a table is set, so take your place. Well, a table is set today, and we have come to take our places around the table. So what word from God could we hear before we taste and remember? Mark chapter 1, beginning with verse 21, tells a story. Let me read. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this, a new teaching and with authority? He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. And adding to that gospel lesson, one verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, a verse that is a part of the setting of this table. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So who is preaching today? You are? Okay. That's a common question that rolls around churches during interim seasons. I realize I'm here most Sundays, but not every Sunday. I wasn't here last week, and Tommy, thank you for preaching last week. So it's a common question during seasons of transition, who's preaching today? It's also a question that probably rolled around a synagogue in Capernaum about 2,000 years ago. Who's preaching today? You see, every week the, the people in the town would gather together in their meeting place or their synagogue 
and one person would be chosen to take the scrolls and to read them and then to offer some word of interpretation on them. Often these were the scribes or the teachers, but not always. It, it kept people on their toes <laughs> because you might be called or you might be or you to read and then to say something about the Scripture. How would you like that system today? And so you might come to the synagogue and there'd be a little bit of whispering, who's preaching today? And then one day in that synagogue in Capernaum, Jesus stepped forward and he read. And as he read, his teaching was different. Everyone noticed He was not like the scribes who interpreted the law. The difference was that Jesus read and he had such authority. There was this great amount of authority in what he said, a kind of power, and that authority made people amazed at his teaching. And while he was teaching, Then a man with an unclean spirit, an impure spirit, came and and was confronting Jesus. And Jesus said to him, be silent. Literally, it means be muzzled. Put a muzzle on, be muzzled. And all of a sudden, the man who seemed to recognize Jesus more than anyone else and who called out, you're the Holy One of God. But then this, this demon left this man, this impure spirit left and everyone was astonished and amazed not only at the authority of his teaching but he has authority over the mysteries of nature and the people were amazed the two went together in verse 27 the people were all so amazed that they asked each other what is this a new teaching and with authority he even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him now this word authority it it could also be translated power there was something different about what jesus said and what he did he didn't just read and comment He read, and as he read, he read with power, and then as he healed, he healed with power. And all of a sudden, people saw that there was something different. So the question that I'm guessing might have been in the synagogue, who's preaching today, (laughs) sort of changed in emphasis. Who is this one who is preaching today? And they were amazed and astonished at his power. I love the hymn that we sang earlier. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus. I stand amazed in the presence. That's what our story is about. It's a story of amazement and astonishment. It's a story of Jesus representing authority and power and people seeing the difference in his life. How amazed are you these days? With all kinds of talking heads in our culture, I mean, are people amazing you with their lives, with their words, with their actions? Or are we just so covered up with with all kinds of noise that there's no longer any real amazement? But that's what they felt about Jesus amazed and astonished and so the story began to be told about this this one who spoke and healed at Capernaum that day who is preaching today let's take that story from the beginning of the gospels mark 1 that's just about at the beginning And let's go to the end of another gospel, Matthew 28. From the beginning of Jesus' life to the end, to a passage that most of us know as the Great Commission. 
You remember how it goes, Matthew 28, verse 18, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. There's that word again. Did you hear it? What's the word? It was in the first story and caused amazement. It was in the last story. It's the same word. It's authority. That's right. Authority. The people heard his, his teaching in Mark 1 in the synagogue, and it was not like others, but it was with authority. And then right at the end, Matthew 28, this passage happens after the resurrection. Jesus is saying goodbye. He is commissioning, and he says, all authority has been given to me. That same word. Same word in the Greek, same in the English. It almost links the beginning of his ministry to the end. We saw that authority and power in his teaching and miracle. And now, following the power of the resurrection, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, Jesus said. And what did Jesus do with it? He gave it away. To you and to me. All authority has been given to me, heaven and earth, so what? So now you go. Go into all the world and as you go, you teach and baptize. You go and share the good news. You go and proclaim with this sense of authority that has been given to me it's, it's as if Jesus was commissioning or handing over or blessing his followers, and that includes us. You go, and go in the name of this authority, and you go preach the good news wherever you are. So who's preaching today? You are. That's what the gospel was saying. You are, all authority has been given to me, Jesus said. And then he says, I'm giving it to you. That you may go and proclaim and tell others about the good news of God's love, the power of Jesus' resurrection, the presence of the Holy Spirit. That is good news to share. And Jesus says, I'm giving you this authority. You go and proclaim and so right now you say time out I'm no preacher I, I can't teach if the answer to the question is who's preaching today if you're trying to say it's me you might say no no and then we hear the next words from Jesus in the Great Commission you go, you go share the good news, you go teach and baptize and make disciples, you go under all authority, and what? And I will be with you to the end of the age. You're not going on your own power or your own ability or your own education or cleverness or intelligence or goodness or morality, you're going because Jesus is going with you. So who's preaching today? You are. And this table is here to remind us. This table is here to remind us. Let's go back and listen again to the second scripture passage I read. From 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. In that great chapter, the Apostle Paul is teaching the church how to observe the Lord's Supper. But he has this one phrase 
For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You get it? Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup or peel off your little plastic top and not get the juice all over you, you know, whenever you do that, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, in a very real sense, we come here to remember what Jesus did for us. We say, in remembrance. We carve it in our communion tables. We sing that wonderful hymn from Celebrate Life, In Remembrance of Me. Absolutely, what we do at the table is to remember what Jesus did for us. But Paul goes on to say, we're not just coming passively to remember, we're also coming actively to proclaim, to preach the good news about a God who loves us so much that he died for us, and a God who is so powerful that he didn't allow Jesus to stay dead very long, and he raised him from the dead, and out of that resurrection, we can have the same. And every time we drink of the cup and eat of the bread, we proclaim that. So what we're about to do around the table, it's not just remembrance, it's also proclamation. And I'm not just the one proclaiming. We all. I love the story that Tony Campolo, well-known professor, author, preacher, prophet, and many other things, he told a story about a communion service when he was a young boy. Listen to his words. Sitting with my parents at a communion service when I was very young, perhaps six or seven years old, I became aware of a young woman in the pew in front of us who was sobbing and shaking. The minister had just finished reading the passage of Scripture written by Paul that says, Whosoever shall eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. That's 1 Corinthians 11, 27. That's the next verse from the one I read. As the communion cup plate with all its small pieces of bread was passed to the crying woman before us. She waved it away and then lowered her head in despair. It was then that my Sicilian father leaned over her shoulder and in his broken English said sternly, take it girl, it was meant for you. Do you hear me? She raised her head and nodded, and then she took the bread and ate it. I knew that at that moment some kind of heavy burden was lifted from her heart and mind. Since then, I have always known that a church that could offer communion to hurting people is a special gift from God. What are your words to the hurting people you encounter? What is your proclamation as we gather around this table? The fact that we have taken some time out of a beautiful day to come inside and to worship and to gather around this table is not just so that we can remember, it's also so that we can proclaim. And we can proclaim up and down the streets in Lawrence and as far as your reach goes, we can proclaim, this is for you, girl, man. This is for you if your life is broken. This is for you. It's meant for you. And it's God's love for you. Well, that's Campolo remembering when he was a boy. I remembered when I was a boy. And I love communion Sundays. I would come in right there, that door, and we sat right about there. 
I would come and the table would be all covered up with all those shiny plates and there was a smell of grape juice in the air and you could almost smell the bread and I loved communion Sundays because I knew the sermon was going to be shorter on communion Sunday. <laughs> what, what, a, what training for a preacher, you know? And yes, the sermon was shorter, but the sermon was also bigger. It was bigger because it was not just the preacher standing behind a pulpit proclaiming, it was everybody. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And I learned later how communion was not just a short sermon, it was a big proclamation because everyone who was coming to the table and taking a bread and cup, everyone was proclaiming the love of Jesus. And it's something we can do. I've thought about this passage a good bit during <laughs> the trauma of COVID and all of the pandemic seasons over however long it's been, 18 months or more. You know, there were times we, we worshipped online. There were times I preached right to a camera online, not seeing a single soul. But I think we all missed being together. And part of what we missed was not just the hugs and the handshakes and talking about football and all that stuff we do together. It was also the fact that we are all, every time we come in this room, proclaiming. We're proclaiming about the love of Jesus. We're proclaiming whose side we're on. We're proclaiming how much the love of Jesus has made a difference in our lives. And we do that most poignantly when we come to the table. But we do it every week. So don't just think that, you know, in worship, well, they won't miss me if I'm not there, or I'm not, I don't have any assignment this week, I don't need to go. No, every week. We all have the assignment of proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. And we do that around the table, and we do that in our pews, and we do that as we lift our voices, and that is the good news that we declare. So who's preaching today? Those words rattled around a, a synagogue in Capernaum, and Jesus stood up. Those words may be in the halls of this church from week to week. Who's preaching today? And of course, the answer, quite simple. Today, as we come to the table, you are. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, you you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So on the night before his death, Jesus gathered with his friends in that upper room. They were observing a Passover meal, but Jesus gave it new meaning. And on that night, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is given for you. And as he did that, it was a gift for us to receive. But as we learn from Paul, it's also a gift for us to share. The good news that Jesus loved us enough to go to the cross and die for us. And then, as he took this bread, he gave thanks. He was about to die on the cross. We are the ones who should give thanks. So let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for bread that reminds us of the body of Jesus. 
and for bread that points us to love that was so deep that he gave himself on the cross for us. And so as we eat of this bread, may we not only remember what was done, but may we proclaim to all who will hear. For it is in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. So would you take from your wrapper and take the loaf of bread and would you eat? After he had broken the bread and given it, Jesus took a cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. Not the old covenant based on the law, but the new covenant. This is my blood which is poured out for you, he said. They didn't understand, his friends at that moment, they didn't understand what this was all about. But we who live on the other side of the resurrection, we know. And once again, Jesus gave thanks, and once again, we should as well. Pray with me, please. Oh God, as we drink of this cup, we pray that we receive your goodness and grace, even as we remember the blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of sins, by Jesus on the cross. But help us not just to remember that. Let our very act of taking of the cup, let it be a proclamation of the Lord's death until he comes again. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take and drink. In these days of COVID precautions, we have a new sound associated with communion. (laughs) Did you hear it in the room? The sound of plastic crinkling, the sound of... So I hope that sound will linger in your ears. I don't know how long we'll need to use the little cups, but, but let that sound linger in your ears as long as you not only eat the bread and drink from the cup, as long as the sound is heard throughout the congregation of the little plastic cups, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The table is always an invitation, an invitation not only for us to come and eat and drink and to proclaim, it's an invitation for those who would choose to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, for those who would say, I want to move my membership into this church family. We've already heard a wonderful testimony this morning about that. Your heart may be saying, that could be my story too. I'm looking for the family of God. So we're going to sing a final hymn, and as we do sing, I'll be right here at the front to receive you. Let's stand. Let's sing together.
As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's also why every time we come to this table, we proclaim about Jesus through giving to our benevolence offering. Those are connected. We are helping people, but we're helping them in Jesus' name, and we're sharing that good news. So as you leave, ushers are at the doors to receive your benevolence offering. We have proclaimed the good news of Jesus right here around this table. It's now time to go out there into that beautiful world to do the same kind of proclaiming. Because who's preaching today? Let's all say, we are. So as you go, Christ, go before you to prepare a way of service. Christ, go behind you to gather up all of your efforts for his glory. Christ, go beside you as leader and guide. Christ, go within you as comfort and stay. Christ, go beneath you to uphold with everlasting arms. Christ, go above you to reign as Lord supreme. Amen.